and welcome to Mystic Dog Mama, the podcast for soul-led dog mamas, where you'll discover how to best nourish your dog and yourself, mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Dr. Alexia Miller. How are you doing today? It's wonderful to have you here. I've really been enjoying hearing from you and getting to know some of you. It's such a strange experience when you create something like a podcast or an art project or a book and you send it out into the world with this intention of connecting with someone else on the other side of the screen or Wi-Fi or whatever, and you have no idea if or how someone is going to receive it. It means the absolute world to me when you get in touch to tell me what your aha moment was or if there was something that really resonated with you or just to tell me how cute Lucky is if you watch the video version. I also really love it when you let me know what kind of questions that you have, or if there's a topic that you want me to cover. I truly want Mystic Dog Mama to function as a community, so please, I'm all ears if you have suggestions of things you'd like me to create episodes on, or if you have suggestions of guests you'd like me to reach out to. Just send me a message on Instagram at Mystic Dog Mama and I'll respond. And before I introduce this week's guest, I wanted to let you know that this episode is made possible by Aspirationary, which is another project of mine where I create books, notebooks, and stationery that are designed to help you become all that you aspire to be. And just like with the podcast, I'm also all ears as to what kinds of journals or workbooks might be helpful for you in your own journey of stepping into your aspired and inspired self. At the moment, we have moon magic and shadow work journals and notebooks that are designed to help you connect with your cycle, the moon, and the hidden parts of yourself. You can check them out on Instagram at Aspirationary, and that's spelled A S. P-I-R-A-T-I-O-N-E-R-Y. Well, you're really going to love the conversation I'm sharing with you today that I had with holistic veterinarian Dr. Odette Souter. She is lovingly well-known as Dr. Poop Lady because of her passion for and expertise in the microbiome and the importance of gut health to your dog's overall health. To give you a bit of Dr. Souter's background, She graduated from veterinary school in Switzerland in 1994, and early on in her career, she recognized the limitations of conventional medicine and started to question its role in true healing. Her own unconventional upbringing combined with her own healing journey has led her to explore many holistic avenues to uncover and treat the underlying cause of disease of her animal patients. As a truly holistic vet, she is passionate about education and has written the international best-selling book, What Your Vet Never Told You, Secrets to Supporting Peak Health for Your Animal. She's a sought-after speaker and teacher in the field of holistic veterinary medicine, and Dr. Souter has developed her own training and mentorship program for pet parents and professionals alike to empower them to think like a holistic vet and maximize their animal's health. Now, this is not your ordinary microbiome conversation. We definitely do get into what the microbiome is and how to best support it for your dog's overall health, but it was such a gift and so much fun to be able to talk with Dr. Souter about the bigger questions that the microbiome invites us to ask, including if we and our dogs are mostly made of microbes, who are we really at the core? And how can a better understanding of the microbiome shed light on how we might heal our dogs, ourselves, and the planet? Not only will you take away some tips on actions you can take today to better support your dog's microbiome, but I'm hoping that you'll also come away with a more expanded sense of who you are and the uniqueness of, well, you. Shall we get started? Okay, let's go. Dr. Odette Suter, I am so thrilled to welcome you onto the Mystic Dog Mama podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And especially if I get to talk about my favorite subject, 
that's always good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I love that you're wearing the poop hat that just makes it all come together just so perfectly. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> it's a must wear. It is a must wear. I agree with that. So I, I invited you on today because we were going to talk about the microbiome. And the, the reason I thought it was important to talk about this, <clears throat> excuse me, is because we hear the word microbiome bandied around quite a bit. And I don't know that there's necessarily a full understanding when we're using that term, what the microbiome actually is and why it's so important for not only our dog's health, but our health too, looking at our microbiome. But the microbiome also offers a really interesting opportunity for us to look at health in a much more holistic manner. And you were the perfect person to kind of dive into all things microbiome and poop and all the things that we don't necessarily want to look at that are so key to our health and our dog's health. So I'm excited for today. Yeah, yeah, me too. Definitely. It's a it's a big subject and there's a lot of research that's happening on it. Uh, when I, I did some lectures for the AHVMA conference, which is the American Holistic Veterinary Conference last year, and I spent about three months just nonstop reading and, and such. And in the process, I looked at how many studies on the microbiome are coming out each week. And when I checked, it was sometime in September last year, it was 800, you know, 800 per week? plus, yeah, per week. So... There's no way of catching up. You know, I think I checked again around Christmas and there were only like 400 or something like that, you know, a little less, but nevertheless, it's ongoing research and it's it's basically exploding. And there's also an exploding amount of information that we're getting in the process, which is makes it a little bit difficult to integrate and to fully understand because we get all this information now you know, all the, the information about microbes and such, but we don't really know what to do with that information yet. And the challenge that we're running into as well is that it takes a lot of computing power to be able to um, use that information and connect it so that it can be, you know, that it can make sense and and then be usable as well. So we're still kind of in the early phases of gathering all the information and then we'll have to see what comes of it. <laughs> no, no, exactly. And and speaking from the perspective as a pet parent, where you start to hear about the microbiome and you start going down some of the rabbit holes with the research, it's absolutely overwhelming and almost impossible yeah. to make sense of, of how you can apply it to your dog. So I thought mm -hmm. today might be a way for us to kind of give a bit of an overview and an entry point for people. And maybe we could start with what is the microbiome actually? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the microbiome is really a community of microbes plus their environment plus whatever they're making. So there are two words that can be used to, you know, as definitions. One is the microbiome and, and the other is microbiota. So microbiota is the assortment of microbes, including bacteria, parasites, uh, protozoa, fungi, algae, uh, so it's basically living organisms, but we also have a lot of viruses in the micro, you know, in the gut and, you know, everywhere else as well. But viruses are not living organisms, so they're not really part of the microbiota, um, So, the, but they're part of the microbiome because they're part of that whole environment, you know, and that also includes all of the biochemical compounds that are being produced by these microbes. You know, they produce like, I mean, they're like a chemical factory. They're, it's crazy. They, they make so many things to make the body work. So we have microbiome, which also, which also includes the whole environment as well, um, and all the genetic material. And when we talk about genetic material, you know, humans and dogs and cats they have somewhere i don't remember around 20 oh i have a slide here <laughs> i can't remember things it's really bad um so we have around you know mammals have around 19,000 genes fruit flies have about 1300 and uh sorry let me start again we have about 19,000 genes fruit flies have 13,000 and uh, fleas have 30,000 genes. So, you know, if we look at the genetic material that we have, we should not look like 
we do and be such highly functional um, systems, right? And what makes a difference is all the microbes that are there. So they provide genetic material to complement our own genetic material. So they actually, if you look at, if you take the whole microbiota and you look at the gene uh, material that they provide, they basically outnumber our genes by a factor of 1,200. Yeah, 1,200. That's so, incredible. Uh, and then if you look at the sheer number of microbes that are living in and around, you know, our animals and us, you know, on the body or and in inside the body, they outnumber the cells by a factor of about 10. It depends a little bit on whether we just went to the bathroom or not, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're basically outnumbered. So what that means is that the microbes are really running the show. And there was one doctor who was talking a lot about the microbiome, and he said that we're basically a heap of microbes dressed up in a suit, whereas the body would be the suit, and we just have a whole bunch of microbes. So that brings us to who is running the show, and who are we would be another question as well, because if we're mostly microbes, you know, who are we really? And uh, there was some research that was done a little bit on that, and uh, where they basically ask the question, how the microbiome challenges our concept of self? Because, you know, who are we? Who is in charge? Who's doing the thinking even? You know, a, where yeah. does consciousness, consciousness originate? I mean, is it coming from my brain, the thoughts that I have, or are just my, are my microbes talking? You know, did I train them well enough or did they train me well enough? <laughs> you know, to know these things. So there are a lot of, questions that are being asked and that we're discovering about the interconnectedness at a, a whole different level, you know, because mm -hmm. we're never alone, you know, we communicate and share with everyone, the whole fabric of life, except that, you know, we disconnected from that to a large extent because we're like, okay, we're a separate entity, our animals are a separate entity, and we're, we've disconnected ourselves so much from from nature and from life in general that, uh, yeah, it's it's basically an illusion because we are not alone. <laughs> well, we're exactly. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think it was um, the Dr. Compton Braun who was talking about the, the fact that we are actually just evolved shells, for lack of a better term, for the the microbiome that they have created this. That, like you're saying, they are the ones running the show. But like at a deeper consciousness level, that they have created this whole system that we call human or dog or, or what have you. That's really designed to feed them exactly what it is that they they need mm -hmm. to be fed. It's just incredible. It's incredible. right, right. Yeah, it's really amazing, and we've managed to create separation and kill things, kill microbes. You know, we've been on a war path, uh, you know, trying to eliminate microbes because they're the bad things, you know, they're the bad bugs, you know, we don't want them. And I think as a result, we've, we've completely lost touch with the innate ability to heal uh, with a trust that the body and the microbes know what they're doing. And so we've kind of positioned ourselves in a way where, there's a lack of trust and lack of trust comes with a lot of fear and survival. So we've, we've really managed to separate ourselves off so well, not that we've actually separated us ourselves off, but like from a, you know, from a mind perspective, we've disconnected. And so now with the advent of learning about all these microbes and all the amazing things they do, we are, invited to reconnect so that we can actually have a better life, a better world. I mean, it, you know, what, <laughs> what we've done to the world is not exactly nice. You know, we've had, we have so much sickness um, out there, you know, physically, mentally, you know, on all levels, you know, we've destroyed the planet, we've destroyed the oceans, we've destroyed a lot of things. And so now with, with all that we've, we're learning about these microbes, it's, it's not just more knowledge it's also helping us to reconnect and reintegrate into the fabric of life you know not losing our individuality in some way you know but reconnect and re 
you know, be part of that fabric of life and and have that, uh, you know, working together rather than separating ourselves and, you know, I'm going to do this. And if you get onto my thing, you know, if you're going to try to do the same thing as I do, then I have to go fight you. You know, it's like this whole competition, greed, um, money, you know, all of that. I mean, money is right. good and all that. It's it's just we have to we're kind of it's bringing us and uplifting us to a different level of of consciousness and and way of being on this planet that is more inclusive, more accepting, more loving, more kind, more compassionate. You know, absolutely. And I think it's also helping us to reframe the kinds of dogmas that we've had around nature and around our body where we've often viewed and I think this is obviously fueled by various um, thoughts on evolution but we're, we're sort of given this story that nature is all about competition mm -hmm. and, and 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 trying to beat the other thing when in reality when you start to look at how evolution has taken place and how nature actually operates it's much more collaborative in nature mm -hmm. than we have necessarily given it credit. And mm -hmm. it, it, it relates back as well to the way in which, I mean, I, I think back to like my biology classes in high school and university where we see, we, we talked about, we looked at, and we talked about the body in this sort of mechanical machine like way mm -hmm. when in, when in reality, it's so much more complex. And as you're saying, there's this interplay between various species between various energies there's all of these different things that are going on that is not just about like something goes in and something comes out in this very kind of industrial revolution perspective of of the body mm. and and how that then relates to the way that we think about health of mm. of the overall system so it, it's exciting to see that looking at the microbiome is provoking a lot of these yeah. questions yeah, yeah. And it, it, it certainly is creating a huge paradigm shift where even holistic and conventional medicine are approaching a little bit more because as holistic practitioners, we tend to look at the whole body. We look at the mind, the spirit, the, the body itself, all the different systems of the, of the body. We don't look at just one piece, right? Um, and we also don't have a one size fits all sort of approach to how we do things. Whereas in the conventional world, it's more mechanistic. It's more like, you know, we look at the lungs, we look at the liver, we look at the GI tract, but we don't really connect the dots. Plus, there's also not a lot of, um, you know, ability to treat and support chronic disease, except for putting a Band-Aid on it and, and covering up symptoms, which you know, when there's a lot of pain, definitely we want that. But nevertheless, they don't have a way of really looking at the underlying cause. And with the whole microbiome research and understanding now that the gut connects to everything and everything connects back to the gut, you know, with the many axes that we have, you know, the gut brain axis, the gut lung axis, the gut bladder axis, the gut kidney, liver, you know, I mean, you can basically connect everything and and that's really bringing the two you know the conventional and the the holistic sort of approach closer together because now the conventional um you know field is also recognizing that there is a connection between everything uh, that they do need to look at things um, holistically and they're also getting a tool um with you know fecal transplants for example to then help to support the body. I mean, there's a lot of research that's being done in, especially in the world of, of cancer therapies, where they find that depending on what microbes are present in the gut, the patient who is getting chemo will either respond well, have good result, have no result, or have a lot of side effects. And that is dependent on what microbes there are. So they can actually manipulate the microbiome ahead of time and then do the therapy and then the outcome will be a lot better and less side effects. So there's a lot of manipulation that can happen and a lot of use of these microbes that will then also make it a more individualized, you know, personalized sort of treatment approach. Whereas before it was, okay, you have this type of cancer or you have a headache or whatever, <laughs> you know, you get a drug. 
Um, so it'll become more personalized because even with the drugs, they are realizing that uh, the drugs are being meta metabolized by the microbes. So depending on, again, what microbes are present, a drug will have different uh, responses or, or results, basically. And the same is true for herbs and other supplements. And we, we've already, we know that, you know, nobody's going to, no animal is going to respond the same way, given the same thing. And that's because of the microbiome that's present and is, you know, part of the, the deal. So now we just have to figure out how we can use all that information of the microbiome to then hopefully have a better way of, of treatment. And that's not just on the conventional side, but on the holistic side as well. Right. Because right. there are so many people who have like a gazillion supplements, they have like a whole supplement graveyard, basically, because they've tried everything and nothing has worked. Um, so with having more knowledge on that, you know, on the microbes that are present or not, <laughs> we'll be able to create better treatment plans as well. That's incredible. So what are some things that people can be doing to support the, the health of their microbiome and of their dog's microbiome? What does that kind of look like in practice? Yeah, so that really starts really early on. So if you have a puppy or a kitten um, or a baby, you know, that's really the time where you want to pay particular attention to the microbiome because that's when the microbiome is very much interacting with the immune system and the nervous system. I mean, that obviously continues throughout life, but in the first you know, few months of life of a kitten or a puppy, and then a few years of, you know, for, for humans, you know, accordingly, um, that's when the training of the immune system and the nervous system happens. And that's the microbiome that's doing that. So that will determine whether they're going to have allergies down the road, food sensitivities, behavior issues, um, autoimmune conditions, you know, you name it. Um, so what I see is that a lot of kittens and, and puppies don't have a really good microbiome to start with, or it, they, it may be somewhat decent, but then we deworm, we give them preventatives, you know, for fleas and ticks and, you know, whatever else, and then we vaccinate them. And then, you know, in, from the conventional world, they say, well, you're not supposed to take your puppy outside until they had all their puppy shots. So they also don't get exposed to microbes. So there's a lot of damage that already happens early on. And then they get giardia possibly, and then they get metronidazole to kill the giardia, which doesn't really work because it's resistant now. So it's like this, this damage that is happening, you know, early on and, a lot of animals then suffer the rest of their lives with with issues and and challenges, and so they're basically already not being set up properly. And uh, some studies in humans have shown that as well, where they found that um, if a child didn't get a good microbiome early on, by the time they're five years old, they would were not able to catch up from a behavior standpoint, you know, learning, emotional control and things like that, if they didn't have an, a microbiome early on. So five years in a human would be probably about two to five months at the most in a dog and cat. That's the time, I mean, obviously preferably before that even, but that's the time where, you know, you can do the most good to support the microbiome of the gut in particular, because that's where most of the microbes are in the gut and um, I mean, there are some in the, on the skin and, and such as well, of course, but the gut is really kind of the main location of microbes. So how, I'm thinking like, especially of like say rescue dogs, for example, that have not necessarily had the greatest start or have gone through real trauma and stress and all of that. How do we help support dogs that would have a compromised microbiome? Is is there a way, I mean, you said that it, it can be hard when we're looking at humans as well for catching up. Is there a possibility of building the microbiome back up and how would we go about doing that? Yeah, and of course, you know, there's always things that can be done. I mean, it, I'm not saying that it completely, you know, if, if you don't have it in the first few months that 
your your animal is doomed. I'm not saying that. Obviously, there's still a lot that that can be done uh, for these animals. Uh, we can do some testing to see what their microbiome is like. And then we can treat accordingly, you know, because oftentimes what I see is they have a little bit of an overgrowth of pathogenic microbes that we call pathogenic, uh, like E. coli, um, you know, Clostridium, for example. So we can help to decrease those levels and then increase the levels of the other beneficial microbes uh, in the process. And that can be done through fecal transplants, uh, orally or rectally. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, it can be done. Uh, Is it anesthesia? Right. <laughs> or which, for most which, animals, unless you have a very fractious animal, but that's a different story. But yeah. I get that question once in a while. I'm like, yeah. oh, it's require that <laughs> that's good news is it also possible to help build the microbiome back up through the use of probiotics and prebiotics because i see that thrown out there a lot as a kind of possible solution yeah. but is that really effective yeah so prebiotics definitely because prebiotics are basically the food for the probiotics okay for the microbes in the gut so those are usually fibrous types of foods like psyllium husk inulin um, jerusalem artichokes you know what kind of whatever fiber you can find in, in different types of vegetables and, and fruit as well so those are the prebiotics and we can definitely manipulate the microbiome uh, through the addition of fiber probiotics there's uh, quite a bit of research out there that's been done for healthy animals, the benefit of probiotics is not really there. So I, I don't recommend it for healthy animals. If they have issues, then we can research which particular probiotic helps with that particular issue. The problem with probiotics, um, not just in the pet field, but in general, is that oftentimes you have on the label, you have the species of microbes on there. For example, lactobacillus rhamnosus, right? So that's the species. But there's a further breakdown into strains. So that's like lactobacillus rhamnosus is like all the Johnsons, right, of a village or a family. But then you have the strain and then you have the individual Johnson. So you have Tommy, Bobby, you know, Denise, whatever. <laughs> And each of those, these, you know, individuals have very different functions. You know, they have different skills. I'm a veterinarian. I'm good with sciences. My sister, she's very good with art. You know, I can draw a stick figure. She can draw like something really beautiful. So they're very different functions. So unfortunately on the label, oftentimes it just says lactobacillus rhamnosus, but there's no strain identification. And there are certain strains that will increase inflammation and others that will decrease inflammation. So you may actually be giving the entirely wrong thing, you know, aside from the fact you don't know what's in it. So a strain has like a bunch of letters and, and numbers behind it. And I can't give you an example right this second, but it's basically lactobacillus rhamnosus and then a bunch of letters and numbers right after. So that would be a strain. And then you can look up that strain and see what is it doing. But the thing is, too, that a lot of the research has been done in the human field. So whether it's applicable to the animal field, that's a different story. So you'd have to see if there's been some research done uh, for that. But in any case, a lot of the, the probiotics are not labeled properly. You know, you don't know what strains are in there. And oftentimes probiotics will also, or most of the, you know, most probiotics are really not the microbes that are present in the gut. So a lot of these lactobacilli and bifidobacteria, they're not really present in the GI tract past, you know, weaning. And so you're basically providing the microbiome with, a, with microbes that are not, don't need to be there. And sure, the, the microbes that are, in the probiotics, they can still make compounds that can be helpful in the healing of the GI tract and have some other benefits, but they don't actually stay. So as soon as you stop the probiotic, you know, a week later, they won't be detected in the, in the stool anymore. So they're transient. They don't stay in there. Um, but the thing is, too, that 
the probiotic industry is huge. And so there's a lot of marketing that's going on and a lot of claims that are being made on the labels and, you know, or on the websites, you know, we're the only ones that have this, that, or the other in it. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> that's just marketing tactics uh, because they want to sell something. Um, because the thing is, you know, we thought that probiotics are going to be the, you know, everything and make everything better. But now you have so many companies that are selling probiotics and they're not going to just fold, um, which is understandable. But basically what I'm saying that a lot of probiotics are just plain old a waste of money. And so, so but there's development happening towards having, you know, getting probiotics of actual microbes that are present in the gut. But that's a little more challenging to do because these microbes are anaerobic microbes in the GI, you know, especially the further down you go into the GI tract, the less oxygen is present. And the more of the bacteria in that area will then be specialized in not having oxygen. And making anaerobic microbes, you know, into a capsule and, you know, culturing them is difficult because you have to have an anaerobic environment to culture them. So it's it's much more involved that way. But there's definitely research and uh, production kind of heading in that direction as well. So we'll have better probiotics to use. But currently, the probiotics that are on the market are not really... I mean, they may help a little bit, but they're not going to fix things. Right, right. And I think there's a lot of concern that I see from pet parents where we seem to be, whether or not that there actually are more cases of it, or if it's just that there's more of an awareness of things like leaky gut, so dysbiosis in, in the system, and concerns about, well, how do we go about treating this? And oftentimes you are you're kind of led down the path of the probiotics and not necessarily seeing any positive results from that. So what would right. you suggest that somebody, you've mentioned uh, doing the fecal transplants as, as an option for somebody, but what are some other options that um, a pet parent might be able to undertake if they realize that their, their dog has leaky gut? How do they support the dog through that? Yeah, so obviously to support any sort of disease in the body, it requires a multifaceted approach. You know, fecal transplant are just one thing. But for example, if you have leaky gut inflammation present in the gut and you're feeding a food that the animal is sensitive to, that will just continue to fuel that fire of, of inflammation. So what I like to do is I like to look at food sensitivities, you know, do some testing. Do they have food sensitivities? And then also, are they making enough enzymes? Are they making enough hydrochloric acid, you know, betaine HCL, which is, you know, stomach acid, because that's necessary to break down things and then absorb things further down. Um, so, you know, we have to look at the at the whole GI tract and, and what it needs in order to be able to function properly. You know, is the liver producing enough bile to, you know, go into the gallbladder and then be dumped into the a small intestine to break down fats, for example. So, you know, all of these things have to be looked at. But then even further than that, we have to look at, well, what is the immune system doing? You know, what what is what are the hormones doing? Because I see a lot of dogs, especially and cats as well, who have chronic vomiting issues and they just have low adrenal function. So they're kind of they're not full Addison's, which is you know, where the adrenal glands make no cortisol at all, but they're kind of on that spectrum. So, you know, hormones have to be present in the sufficient amount as well. And then especially with spaying and neutering, that can affect that as well. Uh, they tend to be more prone to having IBD uh, when, when the hormones are in present. Uh, so we have to look at the hormones. We also have to look at the nervous system because, for example, if the stomach is kind of stuck in the diaphragm a little bit, that can also cause um, challenges. And so we need to make sure that the innervation to the diaphragm is right, to the stomach is right, so that it can actually be in the place that where it needs to be and then function properly. So there are other aspects that we have to look at. And, and that also includes mental and emotional health of an animal and, and the person who's taking care of the animal because they're so 
connected to us that if we're really stressed out, they're going to be really stressed out as well. Um, so again, that's not a judgment of anyone because we live in a world that's not exactly stress-free. It gives us plenty to stress about <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but you know, that's that's an aspect of, of it that we have to look at as well. And then fitness and exercise, you know, a lot of animals are couch potatoes, they don't move much. And research is showing that with movement, it improves gut health, it improves the microbiome as well, especially spending time out in nature where they can roll around in the dirt and, and get microbes that way and you know, eat somebody else's poop. <laughs> in the process and get some microbes that way. Uh, so yeah, there are many aspects that, that play a role in it and that need to be addressed to really fully heal the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah. I talked with um, veterinarian Dr. Tom Lonsdale about feeding raw meaty bones to dogs. And one of the things that he suggested as well is that you actually feed the raw meaty bone if you can, if it's an appropriate place out in the soil, do it out in the yard so that you are supporting that natural function of the dog to ingest their food outdoors and therefore ingest the, the soil probiotics for, for their mm -hmm. overall health. Mm -hmm. And it, it touches on something that you and I were talking about, which was also looking at not only the, the connection to, to nature, but looking at trusting our animals that our animals innately know what it is that they need to do. So going and eating poop is a very, even though we're grossed out by it, it's a very normal and, and healthy feature in, in reality for dogs to help balance themselves back out. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, they they know, they know much better than we do. And I think that one of the first experiences I had of that was when I was taking care of a little poodle lady, you know, tiny white <laughs> You know, you put a crown on her, she would have looked really good. <laughs> but in in reality, when I when I would take her for a walk, and it was in an area where horses would go by, you know, so there was horse manure uh, piles everywhere, and so she would just pick certain piles and eat off of some of those, and others she would completely ignore. So she knew exactly which one was the one that she needed, you know, and. You can argue that it was just the microbes, but maybe fiber because horses are very good at processing fiber. So that may have been a part of that as well. And my neighbor's dog, he eats horse poop all the time. Actually, <laughs> when I see him poop, it looks more like horse manure <laughs> than, than dog poop. It's really funny. <laughs> you should train him to poop in your garden. He can be a natural fertilizer for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm really picky that way. But I have a, a client who has, he rescues a lot of senior dogs and he has one dog who has a little bit of gut issues and he will eat poop, but only of those two dogs that are behaviorally and mentally in a really good space. So he won't touch the other um, poop. He will only eat those two. And then I had another uh, dog patient, he passed away, but unfortunately now, but he used to have a lot of food sensitivities. And because one person in the household kept dropping corn and <laughs> chips, which he was sensitive to, we had to repeat his fecal transplants because he would, you know, end up breaking out again <laughs> because he got into some chips. Um, but in any case, they then got a, a couple of other younger dogs into the household. And these two dogs would only eat his poop. They would not eat their own and they would not eat each other's only his. Uh, so they know, they know, I don't know how, well, whatever it may be, maybe they have a chat, you know, their gut bacteria have a chat with the bacteria and the, or the microbes in, in the poop. I'm not sure, but in any case, um, uh, there's definitely, they know, you know, they know. They do, they do. And I, I think, you know, so obviously with the mystic dog mama, this sort of rests in a, in a more esoteric space as well. And, and some of the conversations that I've had with people also look at the, the energetics, for example, of our food and not just from the perspective of like hot or cold, like within a sort of Chinese medicine perspective, but actually like even things like how was that animal raised? 
what did mm-hmm. that animal eat, et cetera, that you know, we're going to be then feeding to our dogs and that your dogs can sense that they sense it on an energetic level. So mm-hmm. it's beyond just like a molecular um, perspective of scent, for example, they can mm-hmm. feel mm-hmm. Um, drawn to or repelled by things. And I, I think I've had the experience with, with my dog lucky of when I see, when I can actually be really present to that and observe, it is so fascinating and such a mirror for me. I talk about him being a mirror pretty much in every episode because he he totally is a mirror for the good and the bad, right? He invites Mm -hmm. really looking within, but how he is just so connected energetically to the world around him. That reminds me of when I forget that I am also energetically connected to everything Mm -hmm. around me. And that there's an invitation to just as much as I might want to look at, well, how is he behaving around things to see how he's doing around food? Am I paying attention to my own system in that mm-hmm. way? And and am I being, you're talking about stress and all that. Am I being perceptive of my own stress levels and having compassion for that and understanding that that is going to have a direct impact on Lucky's health on every level? So it, they, they really are, you, you had talked about them being catalysts for transformation. And I think that's mm-hmm. absolutely true. Yeah, because they, they don't lie. And they have a very uncanny ability to bring out people's hearts. Um, and I see that all the time with my clients. You know, they come in and there's a problem with their animals. It's like, <laughs> okay, maybe not chaos, but they bring their hearts on on their sleeve, basically. And so it's that's where I can then work with them a little bit more to, to find a deeper understanding and, and such. And more compassion and you know become more self-aware of things and I think that's you know part of what's happening now with all these animals that are sick and all the people that are sick it's really bringing out all the the hidden things that we didn't used to talk about I mean when I grew up we didn't talk about feelings all that much you know you went through teenage years and you're like yeah okay I think I made it but you weren't even really aware of it and now I see in you know the, the kids that are around me it's like they are much more aware of what's going on and and they get more tools to deal with things that we didn't have when we grew up so um, animals are really good at at pushing all of our buttons in a way that creates or you know facilitates a lot of transformation if we're open to that and I think that because we need all that transformation nowadays, the animals are, you know, taking on that role to be catalysts, even though it's kind of heartbreaking to see and watch, you know, how, how sick some of them are. Um, but what comes out of that, even if the animal dies, the people are changed after that. And usually there's a lot of good that comes out of that as sad and, and heartbreaking as it is, there's so much beauty that comes from, from that. Definitely. Definitely. And, and I, I have this feeling, this belief that animals choose us, that they just seem to appear in our lives when we need them the most, even if we're not aware that we need them at the time. And they do, they utterly, they change us. And I think a big part of that is because you said that they don't lie and that's very true. And I think they are very um, heart led beings. Mm-hmm. They, they are not mentally um, centered in the way that we are. And I was talking with Caroline Griffith, who runs the program Canine Flow, which is all about looking at the energetics of dogs. And she she has this theory, and, and I, I agree with her, that they are t- dogs are here teaching us to balance the heart-mind yeah. connection, what we refer yeah. to as like coherence, because they're already in their hearts. Mm-hmm. They are, they're fully there already, and they're inviting us to live in a way to you're opening the door for us to see that that's a possibility and live in a way that is much more heart centered. And that, yeah. like you're saying, that often comes at the cost of them developing various ailments that force us mm-hmm. to, to kind of be in our heart space. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, talking about cats, <laughs> that's a whole other level. <laughs> they push our buttons in a in a different way than dogs do. 
<laughs> oh, yes, they do. They absolutely do. <laughs> They're good at it too. <laughs> they are very good at it. They're very good at it. But but mm-hmm. also you, you had said something that I thought was a really important point and really interesting that when our animals might present with an illness, that it's an opportunity if we choose to see it this way as accepting that everything is perfect just as it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wonder, that. I wondered if you could talk a bit about that, what what that came from for you and your your insights on that. Yeah, because the thing is, in Chinese medicine, pain means stagnation of energy. And if we're experiencing pain, you know, because obviously our animals will experience pain too, but we're talking more about the humans now, you know, and how, how it helps us grow. But when we don't accept something, and by accepting, I don't mean that we shouldn't be doing something because it's it's a little bit of a, you know, contradiction. On some level, you want to surrender and and be in the flow, you know, in the moment and all that. But that doesn't mean you don't need to do something, you know, because, for example, if your dog gets run in the, over by a car or something like that, you can still be sort of, well, you're probably not going to be in the flow, but you have to do something, right? Or if your animal is, you know, has a less lesser issue, like some chronic condition or something, you know, you have to sort of accept the situation and and be with it while still doing something about it. So it's it's kind of a tough thing to wrap your your head around. And I have a hard time with it because, you know, three dimensional, you know, I'm focused, moving forward, doing things. But then where does the surrender come in at the same time? So it's like you surrender, but you still do something. <laughs> it's really it's really weird. But in any case, the more we can surrender and allow things to be just as they are and not necessarily needing them to be different in that moment, that's when then the pain and the suffering can go away. And that's something that's really difficult for humans because we don't tend to be in the moment. And I'm definitely one of those as well. Animals are more in the moment. They're here right now. So they're not thinking about tomorrow. I mean, maybe they're thinking about, well, they should really have the food like right now, even though it's a little early so that they're already like preparing and anticipating to to be getting that food but they're in the moment you know they respond to what's going on in the moment whereas we humans we tend to at least I can't speak for everybody else but I tend to be zoned out a lot you know thinking about things and then I'm like how did I get from point one to point b you know or I think about something and then I walk into a room and I'm like why did I go there you know, because in the in the process of going there, I already went over to some other thoughts and and then I couldn't remember what my initial thought was. Um, so we don't tend to be very present. And that's, I think, what's difficult, because if we were to say I am here right now and really be present. We would know everything is fine, just as it is right now. You know, we have a roof over our head. We have food. We It's warm inside. You know, whatever it may be, we're 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 safe, right? In that very moment, we are safe. But it's as soon as we think about the future or the past that then you know we kind of get taken out of that moment. So it's a good it's good to remind ourselves here and there, you know, during the day, and take a breath and say, "I am here right now." Exactly, and that also touches on things like uh, as a, a Reiki practitioner, when we look at these sort of energy modalities and how they they contribute to healing, a big mm-hmm. part of what they're doing is they are, are bringing somebody or bringing the animal, even though they are very much in a present state, but it's creating that environment. And oftentimes it's working with the owner of the animal, getting mm-hmm. them into a relaxed state where the nervous system is not on on mm. fire, you know, worrying about all of this, the situation in the past and the present or the past yeah. and the future, like you're saying, and to really be present. And that that's what allows the body to engage in its natural healing processes. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Because when we're all in the fight and flight mode, you know, sympathetic mode, it's, it's much more difficult to 
um, to heal because we're like on the go, you know, like there's a different priority happening in the body mm-hmm. and it takes mm-hmm. it away from the, the healing, the resting, the recovering and the, you know, digestion. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. Exactly. And and that's where I think looking at something like the microbiome is a really great way of kind of anchoring this in a, in a practical way for us, because it's the reminder that everything is connected and that you are treating the, the source of everything. Cause we talk about all, all disease, all dis ease starts in the gut mm-hmm. and that by going there first and making sure that we are supporting the microbiome, that we are supporting the overall physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health of the being. Yeah. 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 We have to just go back. And and when you think about it, you know, whatever is happening in the gut is basically what's happening out in nature. It's basically disintegrating things, you know, getting them back to nature in a way, you know, like a compost pile is disintegrating things. It's breaking things down. And so in a way, you know, there's like the outer aspect of things, you know, every winter, everything kind of dies. And then every spring, everything comes back, but it's like the dying, you know, in the, in the gut, there's a lot of, I mean, I don't want to call it dying because there's a lot of good nutrients that come out of it. So, but it's it's like the whole disintegrating of things that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. But, and I think, you know, that was a sort of surprising thing for me when I first started learning more about the microbiome, that that's actually how we are getting our nutrients. It's the, the, the microbes breaking them down. So again, mm-hmm. moving away from the sort of mechanistic perspective of like, oh, it's the stomach acids that are breaking things down into these little bits and it's traveling through the body like that. When in reality, it's this like symphony that's kind of going on between all these various organisms that are breaking things down that make it possible for the human cells or the dog cells in that case as well to even absorb anything. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It It is is really. And we're in a very exciting time now where there's a lot of change happening, you know, so it's, it's really exciting to be alive right now not always easy <laughs> i would say but <laughs> um nevertheless it's kind of exciting to observe everything that's happening you know with like the the dog food, dog and cat food currently you know we're kind of moving away from all the, the kibble to a more fresh diet because there are a lot of problems going on right there you know which we don't know what it is yet but it, it is shifting us to to something that's more you know natural more life affirming um, because obviously a good diet a fresh food diet that's close to what they would eat in the wild is life affirming because it provides the nutrients they need and um, so there are a lot of really interesting things that are happening you know COVID with all the injections that people were getting and and people starting to question because they saw a lot of side effects from that too. Uh, now they're questioning the animal vaccines uh, or their children's vaccines as well. So we're kind of moving more towards a more natural approach to things that is less um, potentially harmful to, to the animals and, and to us. So absolutely interesting. And in the process, it's also a, a bit of a phase of empowerment where people have to learn to grow up and, and take responsibility for the choices they have made in life. Um, I know that's not an easy uh, feat, uh, you know, learning, educating themselves so that they can be empowered and don't have to wait for Dr. Whitecoat or some other politician or whomever um, tell them what to do. So they have to step up and we all have to step up and and take responsibility and and be empowered in ourselves and, and not wait for, you know, and I'm not religious or anything, and I hope I'm not offending anyone, but, you know, the, the whole second coming, and it's like, you're the second coming, you know, That's we it. are, because we're the ones that are empowering ourselves and, and need to be empowered more to, you know, to, yeah. That's exactly it. I mean, we are the I am, yeah. you know, we, we are the ones. And, and I think, um, 
I agree with you about it being empowering. Like something that's been really interesting for me with my journey with Lucky is that I started getting into um, canine nutrition because he was presenting with health problems. And my vet who, bless her, she's absolutely wonderful, but she was the first to say nutrition isn't my forte. So you're going to have to kind of figure this oh. out. So I was going down the rabbit hole of like, what does this even look like? And it was allowing me to confront a lot of fears, not only around feeding him and making sure that I was doing that right, because that was a big thing for me is like, am I going to do it right? Mm. If I can't, you know, that mm. kind of a thing. But what it enabled me to do when I went that, that one step further in my thinking was to look at how much of my agency have I and others given away to various authorities to the point that I don't even trust being able to feed my dog. You know, mm -hmm. it, it opens up that window for you to really start questioning a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. And as I started, I, I got into DIY raw food for him. So not buying a pre-made that's by, made by a company, but having to source all the ingredients myself and putting that together and really seeing it as this opportunity to also look at how, again, from this kind of um, microbiome perspective, everything being linked, everything being one big system that where I'm choosing to procure the meats from is a really powerful choice, right? Like, am I choosing to go to somebody that I know is raising the animals in an ethical way? Am I, and, and there isn't a judgment. It's being aware of the different choices and that when you see that you have a choice, Mm -hmm. that becomes really empowering. Mm -hmm. That feels really good. Yeah. Yeah. And then at the same time, just being open to seeing what comes along too, mm -hmm. you know, because empowerment can also be taken as I'm alone. I have to make all the decisions. I have to, you know, I'm responsible for everything, but I think there's much more to life than, than that. And again, you know, everybody has their own belief system, but I believe that there is something much bigger that is supporting me in that process. So at the same time, as I have to step up my own game, I also have to step up my connection and my ability to to listen and observe and, and he, you know, and see so that I can feel that support and then also asking for help because, you know, we're tiny <laughs> in the That's grand it. scheme of it. we know nothing right which is very humbling um, but at the same time it's also very freeing when I finally figured out that not knowing something is much more freeing than having than knowing everything I'm like that that was huge for me you know because then I started to feel like okay, I'm, I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden I have a thought and I'm like, oh yeah, well, why not? You know? So it, it allowed like other type of, well, input. And I don't want to say that it's separate from me, but it allowed a different kind of input to, to manifest itself. And that was much more potent that I wasn't, you know, I didn't think of, you right. know, like implement. I'm like, Hmm. Oh, okay. Well, let's just see, <laughs> you know, so Absolutely. It's very to, to be empowered and to also let go at the same time and not know. I know it's hard to wrap your brain around, <laughs> but um, it is, it is, but it's like you said, I, mean, I, th I think, you know, I often in, in these sort of esoteric conversations, we'll talk about like, who is the I that's making these decisions, right? Like mm -hmm. you're saying like, who are we if we are this cluster of all of these different beings? We we really have to question like who is the I? And I often come from the, the perspective that if you want to label it like your higher self or source or you know, whatever language that you want to apply, whatever feels right for you, but recognizing that you are connected to everything and pulling on that power, pulling on that energy, so that it's not the kind of ego, small self, Alexia making decisions. It's actually tapping into that part of me that is connected to everything and then being receptive to exactly what you're saying that you then you sort of like magnetize in a, in, in a way the appropriate people or, uh, you know, an article comes across on your feed that you're like, oh, that's exactly what I needed to see. Or you bump yeah. into somebody that says, oh, yeah. I was just going to call you and tell you about this. You become open 
to all of those things that help direct you in practical ways um, with what it is that you are searching for, which in many respects, you didn't even know you were searching for. Right, exactly. And yeah. Who doesn't like surprises? The good yeah. kind. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The good kind. Yeah. I am I'm wondering if we can leave people with a, a few tips of some things that they can do proactively um, today to help support their dog's microbiome. What would what would be the kind of like, say, top three things that you would suggest for people to do? Well, I would definitely get started with some testing and then see where they're at and then work from there. That would be a way to support the microbiome. Obviously, you know, there are the other pillars <laughs> as well, you know, diet, obviously, and then detox. You know, we have to make sure that we don't continuously poison the microbes because they're very sensitive to toxins like glyphosate, which is part of Roundup and can commonly be found in in dry food. You know, dogs that have that are on a dry food diet or cats on a dry food diet, they generally have higher levels of glyphosate in their system because of all the you know, legumes and the oats and, and such that are being sprayed. Um, so just eliminating toxins as much as we can in the environment. And that can include cosmetic uh, and personal care products, um, cleaning products that you use, use in and on, around the house, you know, getting furniture that doesn't have a bunch of fire retardant on it, um, air freshener, uh, sorry, yeah, get rid of air fresheners and scented, um, you know, candles and such. Uh, go with natural things, you know, I mean, what does it take? A little bit of soap and water, that's really all you need <laughs> uh, to clean things, you know, use apple cider vinegar if you, or lemon juice if you want to kill things. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, spend time outside, you know, get, get moving. Um, have fun, you know, connect with nature, let them get a little bit dirty. Um, and then definitely also we'll look at it from a nervous system perspective, a little chiropractic work or any kind of other body work is always good on a regular basis, kind of like, you know, maintaining your car. So that can also help the microbiome because there's a strong connection with the nervous system, obviously, you know, got brain connection. Um looking at hormones if necessary. So there are a lot of little things that, that can already be instituted and just kind of cleaning things up a little bit, you know, providing them, oh yeah, I forgot the water, you know, a filtered water. And that's more than just your refrigerator filter. I'm talking about a real good filter. If you don't have one of those, you can always um, take some big jugs and have them refilled at the grocery store because that's very well filtered water there, usually, um, uh, not ozone. anyways, um, reverse osmosis, is that what they do? Yeah, reverse osmosis water, so take that chlorine and chloride and, and all of these other chemicals that have resistance on the microbes, so that's, that's really important as well, and then, do a little bit of detox, but make sure you have nutrition and gut health a little bit improved before you go into active detox mode. But detox also means not putting toxic things into your animals. So that's a good way to get started and, and get them to feel better. That's perfect. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have various master classes. You've got a book. You've got a lot of resources that people can access. Can you tell us a little bit about them and where people can find them? Yeah. So I, am, I have a book, What Your Vet Never Told You, Secrets to Peak Health for Your Animals or something like that. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's a really easy read where I go into the, the pillars of health that are necessary to create good health overall. Because, you know, you can't out diet yourself out of <laughs> various health issues. It takes more than that. And then my master class um, is available on my website. And that focuses a little bit more specifically on the gut. But again, with the same principles and some of what I've shared here. And then I also have a program for pet parents all over the world where I support them with their animals' gut issues and overall health issues where they get really in-depth support. It's kind of like having a virtual holistic vet at your fingertips, you know, 
close to 24 seven, you know, we do live sessions, there are educational videos. So it's really very guided sort of way to transform your animal's health so that you're not wasting a ton of money on supplements that aren't gonna do anything or vet visits, because I see so many people go from one vet to another to another and they're frustrated, they're overwhelmed with all the information. So I really condense it and then guide them so that they have a good path for that and really can see the transformation in their animals and themselves too. So it's really, oh, that really sounds awesome. perfect. That sounds and perfect. That, and that's on your website as well that people can find out more. Yeah. So they, they, you know, to just find out a little bit more, watch the, the master class, And then I schedule a little interview with people just to tell them a little bit more about it so that I can also get a bit more information about what's going on in their lives with their animals so that I can see if my program is a fit and so that they can figure out if it's a fit. And then, um, and then we get started on that journey. It's really, really quite amazing. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. And I'll leave a link to your website in the show notes. So if anyone wants to just kind of click from there, they can do that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And then, you know, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube as well. So you're everywhere. You're everywhere. It's great. It's great. What everybody does these days, right? (laughs) Indeed. Indeed. I have, I have one final question for you that I ask all of my guests. And that is, what do you feel that your dogs or your dogs you've seen in practice have taught you about what it means to be human? Well, they don't judge, but they're also very honest. Like, for example, the other day I was shoveling some um, gravel that was plowed (laughs) where it didn't, shouldn't be. And then my neighbor's dog came out and he basically whacked from a distance and then he ran right back in the house. I'm like, uh, excuse me, how about being a little more polite here? And so I was a little disappointed that he didn't actually come and say hi. Uh, well, he's, he's a little, uh, he's an interesting dog with an interesting history, but in any case, so he went back inside and then about two or three minutes later, he came back out with a toy. <laughs> so I had the interpretation of, he didn't want me, you know, he didn't want to say hi. So I felt a little rejected, you know, um, with a smile on my face, obviously. But still, you know, I'm like, yeah, I want to tell yeah. hi. Why are you, you know, leaving? And then he came back and brought a toy, which was even better, which meant like he wanted to actually come and play, you know. So, yeah, I don't know what I got out of that. But basically that you know, we, I interpret things in a certain way when they're actually not that. So in a way they're teaching me to look at things and interpret things with a more empowering view, I guess, because we generally have an idea, we judge something, but what if it's not that, you know? Is there a more empowering interpretation, a more loving and a more kind interpretation of what just happened in general, you know, whatever it is. So that's, that's one thing that I've learned or I'm learning, I should say, because I'm kind of hard on myself. I have to admit. (laughs) I think we all are. That's, that's beautiful. And I I think that's a huge, a huge lesson that dogs are, are teaching us that, um, we make a lot of assumptions and we build stories around Mm -hmm. those assumptions in our heads and operate from those stories and see the world from those stories. And it's a great reminder. It's a great example that you just shared of like, Mm -hmm. actually, that's not at all what was going on. He was just letting you know, I'm going to hold on a second. I'm going to go get a toy. I'll be right back. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this has been such a delight. I am just thrilled that you agreed to join and, and share all of your wonderful insights. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, no, it was a pleasure. And I like how it, where it went, you know, it was really deep. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, for all the wonderful questions that you asked and for for being here and for being on this journey and sharing with everyone else and doing you know, sharing your gift with the world. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. We'll have to have you back. Yeah. We'll talk more. 
Thank so, you so much. Yeah, thank you everyone who's listening as well. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thank you so much for listening. Did you enjoy this conversation about the microbiome with Dr. Odette Suter? And if you watched the video version, didn't you love her hat? I told you she was fun. What was your biggest takeaway? I'd love to hear. And to learn more about Dr. Suter's free masterclass on gut health that she mentioned, as well as her mentorship program, visit her website, which is odettesuterdvm.com. I've left this in the show notes, as well as a link to her book. If you're enjoying the podcast, I would so appreciate you subscribing, liking, rating, and reviewing it. It means so much because those things are really important for making the podcast easier to find and letting other mystic dog mamas and papas know that this community is out there for them. Okay, until next time.